Okay, welcome. Thank you so much for attending tonight's financial aid um, programming here through the guidance department at East Central High School. I am just floored um, that we have um, this great of a crowd. Just a reminder, we are streaming live and this will be recorded. So in your spare time, if you're super excited about all this information, you can go to Trojan Media Productions um, and watch this presentation again. So tonight we have our friend Melissa from Invest Ed. She is our presenter. And then we also have Beth Kemper here. She is the director of financial aid at Ivy Tech. So both Beth and Melissa will be available for questions after our presentation. And then I will be here as well um, to help with any senior advising college questions that you may have. Um, so, Melissa, thank you. Yeah. All right, good evening. How are we doing? Are we so excited to talk about financial aid? I know it's our favorite topic ever. <laughs> no, hopefully I'm going to make it a little bit more enjoyable today. Um, we are going to go over quite a bit of information, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So yes, my name is Melissa. Uh, I work for a company called InvestEd. So InvestEd is a not-for-profit. We're based out of central Indiana, but we travel all over the state helping Hoosiers figure out education after high school. So we help with a lot of that process, but today specifically we'll be talking about the financial aid process. So you should have picked up the guide on the way in, and I think maybe some of you, some of you missed it. She has some, she's gonna kind of circulate. So if you need one, you can raise your hand and she'll come around and get you. Um, but I'm going to be referencing this guide, especially in the beginning of the presentation. Um, so yes, we'll be looking at this. I'm gonna point out some things here because I'm not gonna talk about everything in this guide. So if you open to pages two and three, it talks about benefits of education and uh, choosing a career path. So if your student doesn't necessarily know what they wanna do after high school, Maybe we're just, we have a couple options. We're still trying to figure it out. There's some tips here on figuring out that career. Um, specifically, I wanna point out My Next Move, which is kind of in the upper right-hand corner. That's a website we like to suggest, um, especially when you are searching for a career. There's a couple ways you can use that website, including one of them is a personality test, which is gonna ask some questions to your student, and then it will give some careers they think will match them at the end. I did this, and they told me I like teaching and I like helping people. Perfect. So it's pretty accurate. <laughs> the other thing I want to point out on page three is Indiana Next Level Jobs. That's at the bottom. So Indiana Next Level Jobs is a really great program we have here in Indiana where if your student is interested in going into one of those five fields. So we have advanced manufacturing, building and construction, health and life sciences, IT and business services, transportation and logistics. Um, one of those five fields, they can get into this program. They have to be 18 and over, graduated high school. They don't already have a degree the state will pay for their certificate completely. So that's a two to 11 month certificate. It's something less than an associate's or a bachelor's, but it's a really great program to get education after high school without any kind of debt, especially if they're interested in going into one of those five fields. So you can definitely go onto the Indiana Next Level Jobs website, kind of do some career exploration through there, see if that's one of those programs that could benefit your student. On pages four and five, we talk about finding a program or a university. Um, so we talk about finding a good fit academically, socially, and financially, and what all of that means for your student. On page five, we have some resources as well, specifically the websites College Navigator and College Scorecard, some ways to just kind of do some, some college exploration. Um, and looking into that school. I definitely recommend your student going on campus visits. Uh, those are, uh, can be pretty life-changing. <laughs> for example, I thought I was gonna go to a school for three and a half years of high school, and then I got a scholarship offer at another university, went to that university and did a college visit. I ended up going to that second university. So they can be pretty life-changing <laughs> in that respect. So make sure you get on those campuses and visit those schools. Okay, we are gonna start on pages six and seven. That's where we're gonna start today, talking about the money process. So my presentation here, obviously have a couple different ways you can look at it. Um, feel free to take pictures of anything, You know, take notes. If you have questions afterwards, we can go over them, but feel free to do whatever you need to do to retain the information. 
So today we're gonna talk about types of aid. We're gonna go over those first steps for getting ready for that FAFSA. We're gonna talk about the FAFSA and what we know about it so far, and then what happens after you submit that FAFSA. So all that information. So first off is the different types of aid. So first of all, there are two categories of aid. We have aid that is called gift aid, and we have aid that is self-help aid. So gift aid is money that is given to your student to help them pay for their education. It is given to them as a gift to help them, right? So this is money that they do not have to pay back. This is grants and this is scholarships. We then have self-help aid. Oh, it got angry. <laughs> we have self-help aid um, that, oh, okay, we're weird. Um, self-help aid, that is money that is coming from either uh, from employment or savings or from loans. So this is money that has some sort of tie to it that you already have to earn or that you may have to borrow. And so we're going to talk about all of that money here right now. So the first type is the grants, and this is where you see at the top of page seven is the grants. So grants is part of that gift aid that is given to your student to help them fund their education. So here's how you qualify for grants. A, you have to show a financial need. B, you have to file your FAFSA. Okay, so you have to have a financial need and you have to file your FAFSA. So you can see on the screen that we have two different categories. We have federal aid and we have state aid. So federal aid is coming from the federal government. This is money, uh, right, Pell Grant, SEOG, the TEACH Grant. Usually when we say grants, people think of the Pell Grant because it's been around for a very long time. So Pell Grant and SEOG have a range of money, right? So you may get some, you may get all, you may get none. It just kind of depends on that FAFSA. For state aid, you can see three examples here. We have 21st Century Scholars, Frank O'Bannon, Workforce Ready. There are way more state grants available from Indiana. These are just three that we, three that we get a lot of questions about. Um, but again, this is money coming from Indiana. So money from the federal government, the state government, because you have a financial need to help your student pay for their education. A little note here, federal money can be used anywhere in the nation because it is federal money. So if your student decides to go to school in Kentucky, California, New York, whatever, federal money can be used there. Indiana money, state money, has to be used in Indiana, right? So in 21st century scholars, that is specifically an Indiana scholarship, so you have to make sure you're using that in Indiana. So just kind of have to keep that in mind when we're looking at that grant money. So a little note about credit completion. So Indiana specifically has incentivized students to say, we will give you the full amount of grant money we said we would give you as long as you are finishing on time. So on time to the state of Indiana, when we're talking about a four-year degree, is taking 30 credit hours a year. Okay? It doesn't have to be exactly 15 and 15 each semester, but the goal, the goal there is 30 credit hours a year. So if you're taking 30 credits to get to that 120, 30 each year, that's four years for a bachelor's degree. The difference is, is that universities say you just need to be full-time. And if you are only being full-time at university, you're only taking 12 credits a semester, 24 a year, that four-year degree turns into a fifth year. And by the time you get to that fifth year, A, you're not getting into the workforce and earning money, B, you're potentially running out of financial aid, C, you may have to take out more loans. So there's a lot of benefits for, for finishing on time. A, you may be getting grant money from the state of Indiana that says you have to, but B, you know, you want to get out in four years. <laughs> so making sure that we are doing those, those things if we are getting money specifically that says we have to do a certain amount of credit hours. So let's talk about scholarships. This is on the bottom of page seven in your guide, and then obviously on the screen. So scholarships are broken into two categories. We have need-based and we have merit-based. If it's need-based, why do you think they're giving it to you? What do you need? Money. money. <laughs> you need money. So need-based is because you show a financial need. How about merit-based? You did a good job, yes. So this is test scores, GPA, athletics, you won the scholarship, right? A lot of people think scholarships are just based off grades, and that's not true. There are scholarships out there for everything, and let's talk about how we find those. So we recommend looking on three levels. The first level is the national level. If you go to Google and you type in free national scholarship search sites, you're going to find a ton of them. Okay, do not pay for a scholarship search engine. It's a waste of money. There's plenty of good ones out there for free. One of them I like to recommend is called FastWeb, F-A-S-T-W-E-B. It sounds like a fake website. 
<laughs> but it is a really good scholarship website. So fastweb, F-A-S-T-W-E-B.com. So on those national websites, that's where your student is gonna create a profile of themselves and share bits and pieces of their lives. And the national website will filter through national scholarships and send it to their emails. <laughs> They're gonna get a lot of emails, but they should be applying to a lot of scholarships. <laughs> so on that national site, that's where you're gonna find scholarships if you have red hair, if you're left-handed, if you're really short, if you're really tall, you have a certain ethnicity or race, something unique in your background, you have a specific hobby, you like pizza, a, whatever you can think of, there's a scholarship out there. <laughs> so you have to look on those national sites to find them. Next level is the college university uh, level, and this is all about deadlines. So making sure we're applying to school on time and by the appropriate deadline. A lot of colleges have deadlines of November 1st to apply, right? So you have to make sure you're not only applying, but applying by the appropriate deadline. You also wanna make sure that we are sending our transcripts on time, make sure that we are submitting our FAFSA when we need to. The second step at college university level is actually going on the college's university, uh, the final financial aid page, and they usually have a tab called scholarships. You click that and you will see what kind of scholarships are available at that university and what you have to do for them. Sometimes it's applying by a certain date. Sometimes it's submitting your FAFSA by a certain date. Sometimes it's a whole separate application you have to do. You want to know what you have to do to get that money at that university level. So going to the financial aid page and looking into that. The next level is the local community level. So your school counselors are your best bet of knowing the local scholarships. Do we have a local scholarship list? She says yes, absolutely. How do they have access to it? So I will repeat that just for the live. So it's on the shared drive um, on the senior classroom page, right? All the seniors have access to that. If you came to the parent meeting in the, in the beginning of the year, you should have access to that as well. So yes, they have a local scholarship page. They have done the work for you. <laughs> so going on that scholarship page and finding those local scholarships. A lot of the local scholarships open up after November 1st. I think the push is to get the kids applied to school first and then focus on the scholarship part. So the time is coming for those. Um, the next line, it says community foundations. So checking in with your local community foundations in, the or in your county, in your area. Again, those are probably gonna be on that list. Businesses and employers, so students, if you have a part-time job, check with your employer and see if they have a scholarship available to you. A lot of the fast food places, a lot of the big names have scholarships. And then same thing for parents, check with your employer and see if there's a scholarship available for your student as well. And then finally, we have the churches and the civic organizations. So the civic organizations, we like to call those the animal clubs. This is like the moose and the elk and the lions and the, all the animals people join, <laughs> right? Those are good places to look for scholarships along with churches in the community. Sometimes you have to be a member of the church or the organization. Sometimes you don't. So it doesn't hurt to ask and look into it. So, a couple notes about local scholarships. First off, um, local scholarships are usually begging to give away money. They usually don't have enough people applying to their scholarships. Sometimes those scholarships go unawarded because they don't have people applying. So, apply to the locals, right? Even if your student maybe doesn't completely fulfill the requirements, I would still apply, they still may get the money. My second thing is that sometimes people don't apply to the small money scholarships. Uh, big mistake. Small money is money you didn't have before. Small money is money you don't have to take out in a loan, right? So small money is still money. <laughs> so apply to those scholarships. That money adds up, right? Get your name in as many scholarships as you possibly can. Do we know what happens that once you pay your bill and you still have scholarship money left over, do we know what happens to that money? She whispered, you use it on books. Uh, <laughs> what happens is that money goes into your bank account. <laughs> so if you've already paid for your college bills, you still get that money, right? So it's, there's no limit to how much scholarship money you can get, right? You want to get as much money as you can. So go definitely go out there and apply. Um, make sure you're getting your name in as many as you possibly can. So speaking of, 
my company has a scholarship. So this is on the bottom of page seven, or feel free to take a picture of the screen. So the website is investedindiana.org backslash 1,000. It is super simple. So requirements, you have to be 16 and over and live in Indiana, and the application is your name and address. And that's it. So no GPA, no test scores, no essay, nothing. It is very simple. It will take your student two minutes to do it. So the way it works is that starting in February, we're gonna pull one name a month for five months and give $1,000 each. So very easy, they just have to enter it once and they're in it for the full five uh, months. They can come back and enter it every single year, right? Very simple. If we haven't started go going and looking at scholarships, this is a very easy one to start off with. So that invested in Indiana.org backslash 1,000. All right, go ahead and turn your page in the guide to pages eight and nine. We're going to talk a little bit about saving for education. So no matter where you are in the process of saving for education, you can always start. So first off, if your student is getting any kind of monetary gift or uh, having money from a part-time job, start saving some of that money. Get, have them have some skin in the game, right? Put it in a jar, put it in a bank account, whatever you need to do. It doesn't have to be all of it, but start saving some of it. That will help later on. The next two, we have the 529 and the Coverdell. These are specifically types of savings account for college. So you may already have one of these. Maybe you're interested in opening one of these in the future, but they are for college spending. And it doesn't necessarily have to be tuition and fees, room and book, or room and board, right? It could be rent, a laptop, books, things like that. So um, if you are interested in the 529, the Coverdell, I definitely recommend talking with a financial advisor about that um, and look into your options with those two types of accounts. But again, those are nice options for college savings, college spendings. Next up, we're gonna talk about student employment. So your student may decide that they are gonna work part-time while going to school. This is a great way to earn money to offset those college costs, offset loans. They're getting valuable job and interview experience, building those time management skills, all those things we need as an adult. So they can do this in a couple ways. First is called the federal work study. And again, you have to file your FAFSA in order to qualify for this one. So the federal work study is a program where the university may offer your student a part-time job on campus. So think cafeteria, library, financial aid office, something like that. And the idea is that your student works and that money that they get paid goes towards their bill. So it's a nice option to have a part-time job, especially on campus where they don't really have to go very far. Your student can also work part-time off campus. They can find an internship specifically in their field and bonus, sometimes internships are paid. They can do any combination of the above. Here is my word of warning. <laughs> if your student is getting any kind of gift aid like grants or scholarships that says they have to maintain a GPA or take a certain amount of credit hours or something like that, you have to make sure they're doing that first and then taking on a job if they have the ability to. I will share a personal experience. <laughs> My sister went to school uh, and she got a scholarship that was based off GPA, so she had to maintain grades. She got to school, she got on campus, she found a part-time job at a cafe. Because she was working, her grades fell, her GPA fell, she lost her scholarship. My dad was very upset. <laughs> So you want to be careful with that. You want to make sure you're getting that gift aid money taken care of first because that's money you don't have to pay back and do much to get, right? Um, and then if we can manage to do a part-time job on top of that, great. But again, make sure that gift aid is settled. All right, let's talk about the loans. <laughs> so with these loans, I'm going to start off with a little bit of trivia. So I'm going to tell you a true statement. So I'm telling you after the bat, it's true. But then I have a follow-up question. So my true statement is, we have more student loan debt in the United States than we have credit card debt. That's my true statement. More student loan debt than credit card debt. Anyone want to take a guess of how much student loan debt we have? Shout a big number. Ooh, close. Someone shouted a trillion. It's $1.7 trillion. So $1.7 trillion in student loan debt, and it's coming right here in these loans. Okay, so we have to be careful with the loans. We have to understand what we are doing with those loans. If you look in your guide on page nine, you have the same triangle, but right next to it, you said you have a section called evaluating loan options, and that gives you questions to ask, like, who, is, uh, who am I borrowing money from? Who's servicing my loan? When does interest start? When do I have to start paying it back? Right, those types of things. And these are questions you should be asking yourself or whoever you're borrowing money from to make sure you understand that loan process. So I'm gonna take you through the screen. Again, feel free to take pictures, whatever you need to do here. 
So first, starting off in the red part of the triangle, the federal direct student loan. So this is a loan from the federal government that is offered to the student as soon as they file the FAFSA. You literally get the congratulations page, and this is one of the first numbers you see, is that they're being offered this loan. So it is from the federal government into the student, which means it's in the student's name, the student is responsible for paying it back. Typically those payments start six months after graduation, those loan payments. So you can see that there's a rate and a fee in, involved with this one. These come in uh, limits. So freshman year, they get offered 5,500 typically. Sophomore year at 6,500. Junior, senior year is 7,500 each year. Does it mean they need to take the loan? No. Do they need to take all of it? No. So if you do not need to take the loan because you don't need that money, do not take that loan, right? If you only need $2,000 to help you cover the rest of your costs, only take $2,000, right? You have to realize that when you take this money, you're paying it, you're gonna pay it all back eventually, usually with quite a bit of interest tacked onto it. So you have to be careful with that. And that interest is those two words in there, the subsidized and the unsubsidized. And this is where people lose track of their money. So if the government is offering you a subsidized loan, it means that while the student's in school, it is not gaining any kind of interest. So if it's $2,000, it stays $2,000 until after graduation, and then it starts getting interest, right? Unsubsidized means as soon as you take that loan out, interest right away. So if you take $2,000 out freshman year, that $2,000 is not staying $2,000 for very long because every single month it's gonna gain interest for, until you pay it off, which could be a while. So you gotta make sure you understand the loan process, who you're borrowing from, what kind of loan I'm getting, those types of things. The next one in the yellow, or the orange, whatever color that is, is the Federal Direct Plus Loan, or the Parent Loan. So this is a loan, again, from the federal government, but, it is in the parent's name. So this is a separate application from the FAFSA. It is on the same website, but a separate application that the parent would fill out and apply for. You can see that there is a higher interest rate and fee here, and there is a credit check involved there. They're looking for adverse credit. So this is a parent loan, right, again from the federal government. This is in case you need more money to help pay for your student's education, so you would take out a loan to help them pay for that cost. But again, that's a parent loan in the parent's name. Finally, we have the private loans, and that's in the teal. So private loans are where you and your family are going around and shopping. So going to different banks, going to different lenders, seeing what your options are with those loans. You're going to find a variety of interest rates. So you're trying to find the best one. They typically don't have fees, but there could be a variety of options. It could be in the student's name. Student could have to have a cosigner. There could be an income check. There could be a credit check, right? A whole variety of situations happening there. But you are looking around to see what's best for you and your family. So with those loans, again, check out our evaluating loan options, those questions in the guide. Make sure you are asking questions, whether it's to me or our, my company, right, or talking with the financial aid office when you eventually get to that point with understanding those loans. All right, let's talk about how we qualify for all of this money. So go ahead and turn your pages to page 10 and 11. I've been name dropping FAFSA all evening, so let's finally talk about it. So FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Part of my job is helping people file the FAFSA, and people ask me all the time, how much is this going to cost me? The first word is free, so nothing. <laughs> so it is a free form on the website studentaid.gov. So this form is going to ask for a ton of information from you and your family. So information like parent income and assets, student income and assets, how many people live in your household, how, what's the oldest age of a person in your household, just tons of information to eventually spit out a number called the SAI, the Student Aid Index. So the Student Aid Index is the important number here to help you potentially qualify for all of that money we just talked about. Here's how it works. You file your FAFSA, you finish the FAFSA, it gets submitted, you get an SAI number, that's Student Aid Index number. That SAI then gets sent to all the financial aid offices of the colleges and universities that your student put on the FAFSA. These are the ones that they've applied to, they've been accepted to, whatever they're thinking about going to in the next year. The office then goes through all of your information, your SAI, and from there, they send you a financial aid offer with offers of potentially all of that money we just talked about. Grants, scholarships, federal work study, loans. 
But again, in order to get an offer with all of that money on it, have to file your FAFSA and get the SAI, right? So that SAI is a crucial part, right, to getting that FAFSA, to getting that money. So let's talk about this. We uh, had some paperwork up there at the top. There's a blue worksheet and a red worksheet. Go ahead and find that blue worksheet and red worksheet. So blue worksheet and red worksheet are some very handy guides to help you with starting off your FAFSA. So here's how it works. With your FAFSA, this is what you have to think about. This is your student's FAFSA. It's theirs, okay? So they're the one that's going to school. It's their form. It is a singular form. So in order for the student to file their FAFSA, they need to have an FSA ID, a federal student aid account, okay? So a lot of, a lot of students at this point, they are just starting with this process, so they don't have an account. So very simply, the student goes to studentaid.gov in the upper right-hand corner, click Create Account, and they create an account, okay? Here's the other thing. If your student is going to have parent information on the form, the parent also needs an account. So here's what this means. Some parents may have filed a FAFSA for a previous student. Some parents may have filed a FAFSA for themselves. Um, maybe you have an account because you have student loans that you're paying back. Whatever the, whatever the process, you may already have an FSA ID. And if you already have an FSA ID, you need to make sure you know how to log into that. So the way it works is that up until this year, you had to make sure that they were uh, attached to your social security number. So if you made an account, it's yours forever. You can't recreate it. So you have to be able to recover that account if you think you have an FSA ID. If you don't know if you have an ID, you can go and simply try to create the account and they won't let you create an account if your social security number has already been used. Right? So if you go to the account and do create an account, right? if you start making and they're like, mm, we can't make one for you, then you know you already have one and you have to try to recover. And there's ways on the website for you to try to recover that account. But again, both the student and the parent are going to need to have an account with this FAFSA. So the blue paper is the instructions on how to create the account. The red paper is where you keep all that information. <laughs> so the idea is that your student is filling out this FAFSA every single year while they're in school. So every single year, you're gonna have to log back into these accounts and resubmit a FAFSA. And I promise you, you're not gonna wanna be scrambling on how to get into this account every single year. <laughs> so put that login information on that red paper, keep it in a safe place um, where you know it's gonna be. So then every single year you come to your FAFSA, you can log in and it's fairly simple for you. So again, students and parents are both going to need that to have that FSA ID. Here's my suggestion. Get this made, get this recovered, whatever you need to do with your FSA ID, get them made now. So in previous years, you used to be able to sit down, create your FSA ID, and immediately start your FAFSA. And that is not what we're seeing currently. Right now, if you create your FSA ID, you cannot do anything for at least three to four days while the government is checking your social security number with your account. So you're not gonna be able to just make your ID and start your FAFSA. So create your FSA IDs now and get that taken care of. So when you can do your FAFSA, you can just log in and start. So again, get the FSA IDs now, get that going. Okay, uh, oop, there we go. So let's talk about what we know about that FAFSA. It is an interesting year for the FAFSA. That's how I'm gonna put it. <laughs> so typically the FAFSA gets updated every single year. That is not a new thing. It, it gets re-released every single year because they make small changes here and there, little adjustments to the equation. Typically, the FAFSA gets released on October 1 of every single year. Uh, it did not get released 18 days ago. <laughs> it did not. So here's what happened. We had a bill passed on a nation level that is supposed to simplify the FAFSA. That's the word they're using, is simplify. They're supposed to be simplifying the FAFSA, and they told us a while ago that this is going to take longer than we thought. <laughs> so they told us, we're not releasing it October 1. We're releasing it sometime in December. And that's all they told us. <laughs> so we don't have a specific date. And I know that that is very nerve wracking. As someone who files FAFSA for a living, it's nerve wracking, right? <laughs> so sometime in December is what we have right now. We do not have a specific date. So here's my suggestions. First of all, create your FSA ID. They will send you emails about it. I literally got an email from them today. <laughs> So create your FSA ID, you'll start getting emails, you'll get updated about the FAFSA. 
this, I promise this is not just a plug, but if you follow my company on social media, we'll be screaming about it in December. Your social, your uh, guidance counselors are gonna be screaming about it in December, right? And then finally, if you just go to the website, studentaid.gov, you can just look for updates on it, okay? But just know when December comes around that you need to be looking out for when that FAFSA is gonna get released. I'm gonna jump to the bottom, I'll come back to the middle. So sometime in December is when it gets released. You have until April 15th to file that FAFSA. That's the Indiana State Priority Deadline. So sometime in December to April 15th feels like a long time, but I promise you it's not. <laughs> Do not file your FAFSA April 14th. It is not a good call. <laughs> so make sure you're getting that FAFSA filed. I think in this timeline, January, February is a good time to get that FAFSA filed. Right, January, February. All right, let's talk about the taxes. So you will need taxes on this FAFSA. You need taxes for every single FAFSA. So here's how you figure out what year you need. You take your student's grad year, subtract two, and that's the year we need on the current FAFSA. So 2024 minus two, we need our 2022 taxes. So 2022 taxes, this is your 1040. This is your W-2s from that year. So 1040 and W-2s, if you have those. So the FAFSA is going to have a system where you are going to agree to let it go to the IRS and pull your tax information for you. Will this system be perfect and work every time? No. <laughs> They've had previous systems with previous FAFSAs and I can tell you that that system did not work every single time. In an ideal world, they will take you to the IRS, they will grab your information and you won't have to do so much work. In maybe reality, it might not work. <laughs> so my suggestion is to have that paperwork with you, whether it's a digital copy, a paper copy, have that with you with you when you're doing your FAFSA. So just in case you need to look at those documents, you're not scrambling for them later. So 2022, this is your W-2s, this is your 1040s from that year. Okay. So let's talk about this process of filing the FAFSA. So again, this is your student's FAFSA. So this is how you have to think about it. It is their form, it's their school year, right? So they should be the one that's logging in. They should be the one that's behind the computer. You can be nearby for like emotional support or whatever, but <laughs> you, the student should be the one that's behind the computer filing the FAFSA. So I'm not saying that parents cannot do it from the start. I'm just gonna warn you that when I sometimes have parents start the FAFSA for their student, I sometimes get parents filing FAFSAs for themselves. <laughs> so you wanna be extra careful about that because that can cause some issues later down the line. So easiest if the student is the one to start it off, they're the one behind the computer, they log in with their FSA ID and start their own form. Then the student is going to confirm their information. So this is like where they live, their email address, do they have a driver's license number, things like that. It's also gonna ask them to provide consent for the IRS to pull their tax information. So the question is, well, what if my student doesn't have taxes? Your student may not have taxes, they still need to provide consent. They still need to get the system to say like they didn't have taxes, right? So at this point, you must provide consent for the, the FAFSA to pull that IRS info, even again, if your student does not have taxes. So then we're talking about student personal circumstances. So at this point, it is asking them, what year is your student gonna be in school? And sometimes this gets a little confusing, especially if your student has credits. So if they already have college credits from dual credits or AP or whatever have you, whatever, that's good. But in this situation, they're talking literally about the school year. Like they're walking on campus for the first time, they're a first year student. So even if your student has college credits already, they are still a first year student. This can affect financial aid, right? So you wanna make sure that they are labeling it correctly, that they are a first year student freshman year. And then that last, the second question asks them, do they already have a bachelor's degree? Which probably at that point, no, <laughs> right? Again, this affects aid. Then we start talking about personal circumstances. So what's happening here is the form is trying to figure out if your student is a dependent or an independent student. So dependent student meaning they depend on the parent for living, food, insurance, things like that. Independent meaning they maybe don't. So there are some things that automatically make them an independent student and we're gonna talk through them. If your student is born before 2001, independent. If they are working on a master's, PhD, graduate level, independent. 
if the student themselves are married, if the student has kids. And then it says at risk of being homeless. What this is asking is if they are living with someone other than their parents. Those situations make them independent. And then they're going to ask you this whole long list of questions. Uh, so this list of questions is asking, is the student in the military active duty? Are they a veteran of the military? Um, are they an orphan? Are they a ward of the court? Have they been in foster care? Are they an emancipated minor? And then finally, does someone other than their parent or step parent have legal guardianship of them? Here's how it works. If you said no to literally everything on the screen, they are a dependent student. If it's yes to at least one independent student. So a dependent student means they have to have parent information on the form, have to. So if your student is dependent, they have to have parent information on the form or the form will not work, they will not get offered financial aid. Okay, if they are an independent student, it means they do not put parent information on the form. Okay, so if the form says, hey, you're a dependent student, that means I have to make sure I'm putting my parent information on the form. So if you have a question about dependency um, with your student, you can definitely come talk to me afterwards. So there's the screen that says, hey, you're dependent, and you have to know, okay, if they're telling me I'm dependent, I gotta put that parent information on the form. So if there's a situation where their student is a dependent but for some reason can't get parent information, that is a separate situation, which again, if you have that question, come talk to me. We can work through that um, and tell you a little bit more about that. So now we gotta figure out who's the parent because <laughs> we gotta put the right parent on the screen. So let's talk through it. I have a nice little flow chart. I'm actually just gonna fast forward all the way through it and I'm gonna talk through it. So, we are concerned about the biological and adoptive parents of the student. That's who we're talking about. So, if the biological and adoptive parents of the student are married or unmarried, whatever the situation, but living in the same household, both those parents get put on the form. Okay? So, if the biological and adoptive parents are in the same house, both of them get put on the form. That's the left side. Second column, if the biological or adoptive parents are divorced, separated, unmarried, whatever the situation, and living in two separate houses, we have to ask ourselves, who provided the most financial support for that student over the last 12 months? It is an honor system. They want you to figure it out, but they're not gonna check your bank accounts, <laughs> okay? So they want you to weigh it out, try to be as honest as possible, figure it out between the two parents. If you can't figure it out between the two parents, the second question is, if equal, which parent had the greater income and assets over the last 12 months? You wanna answer the first question and not the second question. <laughs> okay, so you want to answer the first question, not the second question. So try to hard, try your hardest to figure out the first question. So we're weighing it out between parent A and parent B, okay, of who pays the most for the student. Okay, we're just going to say it's parent A. So parent A pays the most financially for the student. If that parent is single, meaning they are not remarried, that is the only parent on the form. Doesn't matter if other biological parent is in the picture, we talk to them, whatever. That's the only parent on the form over here, parent A. If parent A is remarried, meaning there's a step parent involved, it's parent A and step parent that gets put on the FAFSA. Not the other biological parent, parent A and step parent. Okay? So again, if you have a question about parenthood, like who needs to get put on that form, come talk to me afterwards. It's incredibly crucial that we're putting the right parent on the form because that affects financial aid, is that parent information. So on this new form, they're going to have a thing called the parent wizard, which is a fun name, uh, where they're going to help the student figure out what parent needs to get put on the form. And then at this point, they are going to input the parent information. And, and you could see that on the right hand side, the parent and then the parent spouse or partner. This is where you, the parent, get invited to the FAFSA form their FAFSA form. So the student has to put in all of your information in order for you to get an email to come help them file their FAFSA. So this is an incredibly crucial part to this, right? So they have to make sure they have all your information, um, their, your name, your birth date, sometimes students struggle with this, uh, social security number, right? Uh, your social security number and then your email address. So they have to have all that information to put into the form so you can come on and help them, okay? So make sure we have that information taken care of. So the next part is student demographic information. Again, this is a lot of information that's fairly simple to fill out. They're gonna ask them what high school they're graduating from, and you're just going ahead and putting that information in there. Fairly simple. 
Then we hit into student finances. So again, this is where that IRS system is, knock on wood, gonna work. <laughs> so they will take you over to the IRS and pool taxes for your student, regardless if they have them or not. So the way the system works is that they are not gonna show you the questions they take from the IRS. It's a smart form, so they're not gonna show you those. If they do show you a question, it means they need an answer, even if it's zero. Right, so that, that last question, foreign earned income exclusion, chances are your 17 year old doesn't have foreign earned income exclusion, right? So put zero. <laughs> so if this, the answer is that question is showing up on the form, you need to give them an answer even if it's zero. So then we go to school selection. So this is where your student is listing all the schools they want to receive their FAFSA information. So this is the schools that they have applied to, that they've been accepted to, they're still waiting an answer for, whatever. They need to list them here if they want the financial aid office to get their FAFSA information. So you can list up to 20 schools. I don't recommend listing up to 20 schools, but you have that availability to list up to 20. This is a federal form, so this is schools all over the nation, not just Indiana, but obviously we'd like you to stay in Indiana if possible. And then you can always edit this list. So say you file the FAFSA in January, and then in March your student decides they're gonna go to a completely different school. You can log back into your FAFSA, add that school in, that information will get sent to them. So you can always add that list, edit that list. So at this point, the student section is done. So the student will get this little long mumbo jumbo from the government that says, I promise I'm not lying to the government. <laughs> and so they go through and they click their box and they say, yes, I promise I'm not doing that and they submit their form. However, this is not the end of the form. This is only the end of the student section of the form. Okay, so this is the only end of the student section. So at this point, right, it tells them, congrats, you did your student section, make sure your parent checks their email. <laughs> so at this point, the parents are gonna get some sort of email that says, hey, we need you to log in. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about right now, the parent info. So you as the parent, again, if they put all your information in there correctly, will get an email that says, so-and-so has invited you to their FAFSA form and we need you to click this button. <laughs> so you're gonna go onto the FAFSA and you are going to log in with your FSA ID. Again, because you have an account that you've already taken care of. <laughs> so you log in with your FSA ID and it will connect you to your student's FAFSA. At this point, you need to confirm your personal information. Again, a lot of this information is coming from your FSA ID already. And then you also need to provide consent to the IRS to get your FAFSA, your, your tax information into the FAFSA. Again, you have to provide consent in order for that system to work. Have to. So the first step for parents is parent demographics. Again, this is fairly simple. Asking about your current marital status, current marital status, and any of your other personal information. Again, just go ahead and go through the steps. And then we go into the parent finances. Same thing as like student finances, they're gonna connect you to that IRS. They will not show you the answers they already pulled from the IRS, but if there is a, a question, they need you to give the answer even if it's zero. Right, so same situation, go through that. There are some questions that you may need to edit. So they're gonna ask you about your family size. So if for some reason your family size has changed from your 2022 taxes, that might be something you need to edit. They're also gonna ask you for the number of students you have in college that year. So they're gonna ask you those questions. So again, if they show you that question, it means they need an answer. So let's talk about assets. They are gonna ask students for their assets, and I didn't talk about it at that point because typically students don't have a ton of assets at this point, right? However, parent assets can be a little different. So let's talk about parent assets. Here is what they are not asking for. They are not asking you for the value of the home you're currently living in. So your house, they're not asking for the value of that. They are not also asking for your retirement accounts. They don't wanna know the numbers of your Roth, your IRA, your 401k, whatever. So those which retirement accounts are not a part of the assets. Here's what they're asking. The first question is asking, what kind of child support did you receive in the last full calendar year? So what you actually received, not what you were supposed to receive, but what you actually received, right? You're supposed to try to total that up for the last full calendar year. 
The next question is asking is, as of that day, what is the total of your cash, checking, and savings accounts? So you're gonna have to go into your bank account and total them up. I have mobile banking, I could just log into my accounts, figure out what I got going on, right? Again, they are not asking you for retirement. The next one, next one is asking about small business and family farm. So if you have a small business or a family farm, this is a new one that they are asking in this year in the asset question. So the way that question is phrased, it says current net worth of business and investment farms. So it says, enter the net worth of your business or for profit agriculture, agricultural operations. Net worth is the value of your business or farms minus any debts owed against them. This is complicated, and I will tell you right now, I am still learning this process. <laughs> it is a new thing on this form. But I would definitely talk to an accountant or your financial advisor, especially if you have a small business or farm, right, to try to work out that net profit. And again, if you have questions, definitely come talk to us. We're learning as we go as well. Finally, the last question is asking you to total up the rest of your assets. So it's asking for real estate, real estate that you're not currently living in. So again, not your house, but if you have rental property or a piece of land somewhere, they want the, the number for that. They want the number of your stocks, your bonds, your 529 college savings accounts, any other kind of investments you have. Another new thing that is happening is how they're treating the 529s. So it says, Education savings plans still counted as parental assets, but only if the account is registered for that student. So if you have three 529 accounts, you only need to count the one that we're currently talking about for this student. That's a new thing this year. So there's quite a few new things on the assets. Um, again, we're learning as we get new information. You can definitely talk to us um, about that asset question if you have questions. So at this point, we're confirming if there's another parent and putting that other parent in, info in there. Um, again, they may be asked for an FSA ID depending on the situation. Typically, only one parent needs it, but again, maybe in certain situations, a second parent may need it as well. But confirm that information. And then finally, this parent is doing the same thing that the student did. We are reviewing and submitting. So again, mumbo jumbo from the government that says, I promise I'm not lying to the government. You click your little box and you send it on its way. So if the student has already finished their section and submitted their section, then the parent finishes their section and submits their section, that is the end of the form. The parent is sending the form. Okay, so if students are already done and then parents is finishing theirs, sending it, that's the end of the FAFSA, okay? So whoever is the last person to finish their section, that's submitting the FAFSA, okay? So at this point, right, we submit, everyone agrees, we sign our paperwork. Then, let's see what happens afterwards. So after you get your FAFSA, once you submit it automatically, you're gonna see a couple things. So first, you're gonna see your estimated SAI, which is that student aid index number, that's the number that gets sent to the financial aid offices. You are then gonna be able to look at all your FAFSA form answers. So if you wanna double check your numbers, you can go in there and look. You'll also see a button called Next Steps. So this is if you wanna correct any errors, you can update school information, you can see if a school needs some other separate doc piece of document or something like that, if you need to send them something else. The other thing you're gonna see here is three potential numbers slash things. So at the end of the form, they're gonna show you the federal Pell Grant and if you potentially qualify for that Pell Grant. So they'll show you a number if they think you're gonna qualify for the Pell Grant. You're gonna see zero if, you don't, if they don't think you're gonna get the Pell Grant. All right, so the Pell Grant potentially if, you, if they think you're gonna qualify for that. The next number you see is the federal direct student loan and again, that's that loan that's automatically offered to the student as soon as they file the FAFSA. And then finally, the last thing they're gonna potentially see is that federal work study. You can see over there it says that they may be eligible. All other aid is gonna show up later. So if you know your student is a 21st century scholar, that's not gonna show up here. If you know that a university has already offered them some money, not gonna show up here. All other aid comes later. The only things you're gonna see here is that Pell Grant, the federal student loan, the federal work study. So special circumstances, here's the reality of the situation. Uh, we have to use the 2022 taxes on this form, have to, but your student is going to school in the year 24-25, and that's 
a couple years difference. <laughs> your family may have been affected by something that has affected your, your financial, system, your financial uh, income, whatever way. So I have a list of what can be considered a special circumstance. This is not the end all be all, but what we're looking for here is, okay, I'm looking at my 2022 taxes and my income listed there, that's not matching my 24 lifestyle right? So maybe it's a change in employment or income, medical expenses not covered by insurance, change in parent marital status, unusual dependent care expenses, right? Something that has affected your finances from 2022 that's not showing up in those taxes. I'll give you an example. I'm from Johnson County, which is just south of Indianapolis. We had tornadoes twice in six months. There's a lot of property damage, right? So that's a special circumstance. There, again, this is not the only list. So if you think you have something that is not showing up in your 2022 taxes that you have to use on this form, you may be able to apply for more financial aid. Here's how the process works. You still have to use your 2022 taxes on that form, but after you file your FAFSA, you go to the financial aid office's uh, webpage, they usually have a tab called special circumstances, and they will tell you what you have to do to apply for more financial aid. It's usually a separate document you have to fill out. You're gonna have to prove that you have a, some sort of income discrepancy, right? But they may be able to give you more money from the financial aid office. It's not a promise, but it's an opportunity. Yeah. Yes, the college's financial aid office, yep. So you still have to file your FAFSA, file it with the 2022 taxes, but then afterwards go to the financial aid office webpage and find special circumstances. If you wanna run through a special circumstance with me, if you wanna see if something may qualify, you can talk to me afterwards. So eventually you will get your financial aid offer. So these are gonna, timing and delivery of them are gonna vary, especially with such a weird year of the FAFSA. You gotta think about it, October, November, December, they're missing out on three months, right, of being able to assess everything. So some colleges are gonna take a little longer. Some of the private universities that maybe have smaller clientele will maybe be able to get their letters out faster. The bigger universities, they got a lot of people to work through, it's gonna take a little longer. So you just kinda of have to be on the lookout for them, but springtime is the general time when these come out. They're gonna show you the same thing, although they may look a little different from each other. Work on they're gonna show you is the cost of attendance, so how much it costs to go to that school for the year. They're then gonna show you financial aid that they are offering you. So this is all that money we just talked about. So grants, scholarships, work study, loans. They're gonna subtract that from the cost of attendance and then they're gonna show you what the remaining balance is, which is how much it costs to send my student to that school. So at this point, we assess. So if your student is looking at multiple schools still, they need to figure out, looking at the financial aid offers, what's gonna work for you and your family. You wanna make sure you clearly understand your obligations, especially if you're getting grant money or scholarship money, right? If you understand how that money's getting applied, what you have to do for it, and then again, with the loans, if we have to take out a loan. And then finally, ask questions. Again, this is something that my company can help with. We can help you figure out financial aid offers or talk with the financial aid office that that university it's coming from. So here is my final thing. It is an example financial aid offer. So this is a university, a public university in Indiana. So like a Purdue, IU, a Ball State. This is just an example. So at the top, we have cost of attendance, tuition and fee, food, oh gosh, tuition and fees, <laughs> housing and food. It's not called room and board anymore. It's called housing and food, which is taking me a second to remember. So <laughs> tuition and fees, housing and food. Those are direct costs. Direct costs are exactly what it takes to go to that university. That's the exact payment. All cost of attendance also have estimates. So they have estimates on books and supplies, transportation, miscellaneous personal expenses. They're just trying to give you a little bit more of a well-rounded picture of what that year is gonna cost you. So for the year, $26,200, okay? Through the FAFSA, this student qualifies potentially for that Pell Grant, money from the federal government, Frank O'Bannon State Grant, which is money from Indiana, and then a scholarship from the actual college itself. So $11,000 in gift aid, money they do not have to pay back. That's money we use first. Then they have the opportunity to accept the federal work study, which is that part-time job, and then they have their loan. So their loan is that $5,500, but it's split. We have subsidized and we have unsubsidized. And again, that's that interest. So we wanna make sure we understand how that interest is working out. So if they accept the whole financial aid package, that's 19,500, we subtract that from the cost of attendance, we have a balance of $6,700 left. And that's where we gotta figure out 
how we paying for that. So did my student do their job and look for scholarships? Did they get $5,000 worth of scholarships? Apply it to the balance. Um, do we have a 529 or a savings account that we're using for this, for this cost? Apply that. Does the university offer a payment plan? Because sometimes they do, right? So do I, if, they, if they do that, you're not just paying in one lump sum, you're paying month to month. Sometimes that's a little bit more manageable. And then finally, after looking at all of our other options, do we need to look at the PLUS loan? Do we need to look at private loans? But we look at everything else first before potentially taking on more debt. Okay, so this is a ton of information and I also know it's very overwhelming. <laughs> it's a lot, it's a lot to intake. So we are here to help. So first off, if you go to our website, investedindiana.org, we have tons of resources. I gave you two of them here today, two of those worksheets, but these worksheets are available on our website for free. You can print them, save them, whatever you need to do. They're available for you in investedindiana.org under the resource tab. Ooh, what's happening? Oh, there you go, College Goal Sunday. So this is a great opportunity that we have here in Indiana called College Goal Sunday. The way it works is that the last Sunday in February, we are gonna be stationed, we meaning everyone at my company, uh, financial aid professionals from all over the state, FAFSA professionals, we're gonna be all over the state helping people file their FAFSA. So if you go to collegegoalsunday.org, you'll be able to find a location nearest you. Usually it's at the Ivy Techs. <laughs> She's saying yes. <laughs> so usually it's I Ivy Techs that we could do College Goal Sundays. Usually we're at um, high schools as well. But if you go to the website, you'll find a location near you. So on that Sunday at 2 p.m., 2 to 4 p.m., you can just show up. You do not need to make an appointment bring your tax documents and we will help you file your FAFSA so very easy really nice resource we have here in Indiana so again that's the last Sunday in February collegegoalsunday.org there's our socials again you don't have to follow us but if you'd like some information about the FAFSA and a little reminder about when that FAFSA is going to come out I promise you we're gonna be screaming about it from our socials <laughs> And then finally, the number in the email. So the number in email is everywhere. It's at the bottom of the worksheets. It's at the bottom of every page in this guide. It's on the back of the guide. It's all over the place. You could take a picture. This number in email goes to everyone on my team. So there's six of us. Uh, we are here to help you with whatever question or thing you need to talk about. We're not selling anything. We don't have anything to sell. <laughs> so we're not charging you anything. We're not trying to get you to buy something. So completely free. We're just here to help. All right. Any big questions that we have? Yes, in the back. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I don't think that information is taken into account when they're looking at that. She says no, our Ivy Tech financial aid expert says no. So I don't think that is something that necessarily needs to be considered. Okay, if you wanna come talk to us afterwards and clarify, we can come talk to you. Any other big questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. So the question was, um, a lot of universities are no longer requiring SAT, ACT, so uh, blind, blind schools, college, like whatever, test score blind. Um, but the question was about scholarships and whether they have that. It's honestly all going to depend on the scholarship. They all have their requirements, so you're just gonna have to see what they need and go from there. Um, again, for the college university level, I would look on the scholarship page at the college university level and see if they need that. Because um, yeah, and transcripts you can ask, you can say like, I don't want my score on there or I do want my score on there. I would just check with the university to see what they need. Yeah. Other big questions? Yes. This is complicated. Okay, so <laughs> it's okay. I'm glad you asked because this is a good...